Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Mother Good Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're doing another video podcast, and so if you'd like to see the video version, you can look in the show notes of this episode, and then you can click on it for the YouTube link, or you can just continue to listen along in the app that you're listening to. And also, we would really appreciate it if you would hit subscribe uh, to our podcast. It would help us so much in terms of rankings and just so people can get more visibility. And also, uh, if you have a couple extra seconds just to rate us, you can either just click five stars or whatever stars you want. You know, if you want to give one, that's fine too. So however many stars you want to give us and then do a little write-up too, that would also help us out so much and we would really appreciate it. And before we get into into today's episode, I just want to give a little disclaimer that nothing in this episode is medical advice. It's just for informational purposes only. And we're just sharing this episode just for informational purposes, just to raise awareness around this medical condition. So with that, I would love to welcome Meg to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Emily. Well, I'm so excited to have you on. I know that we had originally recorded an episode after you had only had your first child. And then once you got pregnant with your second, then I, you know, I was thinking, well, well, let's wait for a little update to see how it goes. And I'm glad that we did wait because you have some more information to share with us about your experience. So, but before we dive into your postpartum story, I would just love for you to describe, uh, you know, who you are, tell everyone about yourself and your background, what you do for work, uh, where you went to college, those sorts of things. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Meg McCachron. I have been married to my husband now a little over three years. We met at the University of St. Thomas, where he was studying physics and I was studying biology. So we had the science nerd thing going for us. Um, We got married during my uh, first year of graduate school at the University of Minnesota. Uh, My husband has since finished his graduate uh, education, but I am in the midst of a PhD in conservation biology there. So uh, again, the science nerd thing still going strong for us. And as you alluded to, we now have two wonderful children. Our daughter, Teresa, was born uh, a little less than a year after we got married in December of 2018. And then my son, James, was born in October of 2020, uh, last year. So he was that classic pandemic baby that still hasn't really seen what the real world is. Um, But uh, so that's our little family. We live in St. Paul, Minnesota, and are very big on the outdoors and all things related to that, as well as pretty much anything science or nerdy. So uh, always happy to talk science and things like that, as well as um, fun things. It's funny because I know that we are both a member of the same online birth, uh, what do you call it, like the due date groups or something like that online. Yes. And we had no idea that independently of each other that we named our second children the exact same name and the exact same nickname. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. I, I have to say you have great, uh, great taste in names. So yeah, uh. <laughs> same here. You have great taste. I just thought it was funny because obviously we, we never really share uh, to anyone what we're thinking of for names, like not even friends or family, just because we don't. We just want to form our opinion independently of what everyone else is saying. I mean, it's not against anyone else. It's just, you know, we as a couple, we just want to independently form our opinion. We don't want to hear, you know, like those, I feel like everyone has a comment about every single name in existence. You're like, oh, well, that reminds me of so-and-so or whatnot. And so my husband and I really like the name James. And I know that you, we, so we are already pretty set on it. And then I think you, your, your son was born in October, you said, right? Because yes, my jam yeah, a couple in November. <laughs> so I yes. remember telling my husband, I'm like, oh my gosh, I named him the exact same name. And then uh, do you still call him, you call him Jamie too as a nickname or? Yeah, he's got, you know how nicknames kind of twist and turn and now he gets called all kinds of crazy things. But <laughs> Jamie is the sort of public facing nickname that I hope sticks because I really like it. I think it's cute. Yeah, yeah. I think it's cute too. And my my daughter uh, came up with kind of like a little version of that James E. And so sometimes I call him like James E. But anyway, cute. kind of fun cute. fact about both of us. So anyway, so yeah. I'd love for you to just dive into your postpartum story. And I really as I mentioned on the podcast many times that I just love hearing different women's pregnancy and postpartum stories because it, it just, it's 
it's better illustrative, I think, than just pure data, especially when something's more rare, because then you think, oh, well, this, you know, this medical condition is super rare. Uh, so you don't really hear that much about it. Um, but then you also don't hear from the women who have had those rare, uh, sometimes, sometimes not rare. It's really just uncommon, some medical conditions, because when I was looking at the stats for uh, the condition that you have, the postpartum hypertension, that I, I, I mean, obviously, I don't have a medical background, but I don't know if I would say that the percentage makes it rare, like maybe it makes it uncommon, but it's just so nice and refreshing to hear a story. And also, I, in my opinion, I think it sticks with women more if they hear in story format. So with that, I would just love for you to dive in. Maybe we can first start off with uh, your first child and that experience, and then we can go from there. Yeah, for sure. So like I said, my daughter, Teresa, was born in December of 2018, a little bit less than about three weeks short of our first wedding anniversary. So very new, uh, newlyweds, very new parents. Um, I had thankfully had a fairly uneventful pregnancy, like fairly healthy, of course, dealt with morning sickness like so many of us do. But uh, I was excited to have, um, you know, a, a, a birth that I felt like was going to be um, everything you hope birth will be, right? Empowering and exciting and beautiful and maybe a little painful, but you push through. Um, But of course, you never uh, have exactly what you expect. And my daughter was uh, coming up on a week overdue. So we had to start talking about induction and all those scary terms and scary words. And suddenly your perfectly crafted birth plan starts to just bit by bit fall apart. So I was feeling a little nervous about that. And having to be induced and things like that, but all things considered it, it went really well. Like I had, um, fairly minimal injury. She was perfect. 10 out of 10, really wonderful, healthy experience. And we went home shortly after. So all things considered a positive birth experience. Once we got home though, um, I still was not feeling like I was recovering super well. I felt like, you know, in addition to all the typical things that you expect to feel, I still just felt really, um, kind of tired and just a lot worse than I thought I should be feeling at that time. About six days after my daughter was born, so when she was about a week old, um, I was on the phone with a friend and I noticed my face was feeling very hot, kind of flushed. So I went and looked in the mirror and I had very bright red cheeks, just very dark. And it looked almost like a rash. So I kind of kept an eye on it through the evening. I took a Benadryl. It seemed to go down. You know, It seemed to make it go away. But then my cheeks started getting red again. And my face started swelling and I was like, gosh, what, what is going on? And typically with rash and swelling, you think it's, you know, some sort of allergic reaction or something like that. So I called the doctor and they said, well, you should head to the emergency room if you get, you know, lip or facial swelling, because that can be a sign of um, a greater, more serious like anaphylaxis. So of course, that's exactly what you want to hear when you're six days postpartum is you need to pack up and leave your baby at home and go to the ER. So that was a really scary experience. Um, I felt very nervous about leaving my daughter. I felt really scared for what was going on with me. Uh, and it, it didn't get better when we got to the ER. They, they were unable to identify anything that had caused the reaction in my face. I still to this day don't really know what that was about. But when I got there and got all hooked up to the monitors, they realized my blood pressure was quite high. Uh, I think it topped out at about 200 over 100. Wow. And a typical adult blood pressure is about 110 over 60 to about 120 over 80. So I had extremely high blood pressure and it was not coming down. I ended up staying overnight in the hospital that night and through a combination of medication to treat what they thought was some sort of allergic reaction, as well as um, starting a blood pressure medication, I was able to get my pressures down into the more kind of chronic hypertension range. Um, But then I got sent home on a pill to take twice a day, every 12 hours, uh, and with not a whole lot of explanation beyond that. Mm. The kind of classic uh, etiology of high blood pressure is, of course, preeclampsia. So the doctors were very concerned about that. But all my labs came back perfectly normal. No problem with liver, no problem with blood, no problem with stomach, Um, just hypertension, unexplained. And over the next several days, um, I kept taking my blood pressure at home. I thankfully got a blood pressure cuff so I could do it at home. 
and it still kind of wasn't going down. It was, it was hovering in that state. They call it stage one hypertension. It's not going to kill you immediately, but if you went to your doctor's office and you had that, they might suggest, you know, lifestyle changes or medication to bring it down. So I had to get another increased dose of medication um, and was on that for about six weeks. At that point, I started to uh, find that my pressures were doing okay when I was not on the medication or at the end of the period of efficacy. So I was eventually able to wean off of it. Um, in about eight weeks postpartum, I was able to be fully off of the medication at the time. So it kind of just went away um, after, after that period of time. Uh, I'll tell you about what happened with my son then, um, unless you had any questions about that part of the, the story, but, uh, just spoiler alert, similar thing with my son. I can, I can talk about that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's crazy just listening to your story too, that you, when you were experiencing these symptoms that were very specific to obviously having a child and giving birth that you just had to go to the regular ER you know, as opposed yes. to something a little bit more specialized. And I don't know, how did you feel about that? Do you, do you think that they maybe would have been a little bit more in tune with what you just went through if it was like, I don't know, like pregnancy related or you're able to go to like a separate ER for pregnant or postpartum women? Yeah, I, I think this story and my experiences are sort of a case study in the shameful state of postpartum care for women in America mm -hmm. um, in a number of different ways. In the acute sense, like exactly like you said, when I went to the ER, they didn't really know what to do with me. They were like, so you're postpartum, but you don't have preeclampsia. Right. Uh, and I asked questions like, can I breastfeed on this medication? Many of the people I talked to didn't have an answer for me at the time. Right. Um, I asked, you know, am, should I can I bring my baby in? And it was sort of like a, mm, I don't know, maybe. It wasn't until I was readmitted to labor and delivery and the actual postpartum wing of the hospital through the ER that they started to kind of have a clue of what to do with me. But oh. even then they said, so how far along are you? And I said, well, I gave birth six days ago. So that, that position of being postpartum was very strange to them. They don't typically see women postpartum, right? They right. see them maybe one or two or three or four days at the most. So the fact that I was a week out and coming back in was sort of foreign. When I saw a, a nurse at my OBGYN clinic, she said the same thing. How far along are you? You know, what brings you here? And I had to explain again, you know, I'm not pregnant anymore. But wow. typically you wouldn't see your doctor or, or postpartum care until um, you know, until about six to eight weeks postpartum. So they did not know what to do with me immediately, uh, immediately following. That's interesting. So you were actually admitted to the labor and delivery ward then eventually when yes. you went to the emergency room? Yes. Okay. Yes. I got admitted back into labor and delivery. So I was back in the back of the same suite of rooms I had been in a week before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I, I didn't realize that you had been readmitted to the, the yes. labor and delivery ward. I, I, one reason why I bring that up is that when I was pregnant, uh, with James, uh, my James, that, uh, I actually had to make an ER trip. I mentioned this on another episode when I was talking about my postpartum mm -hmm. journey a few episodes back, yeah. if you want to listen to that, but I actually had to take an ER trip when I was Gosh, I can't even remember how many weeks I, I was I, towards the end of my first trimester. And basically, they they were kind of confused, too, because yeah. my symptom was that I, I it's kind of silly to say it. I basically the only problem I had was I couldn't pee and it was just so weird. And oh, so I, I didn't oh look pregnant either. And so they're like, well, mm. why can't you go? You know, it was just kind of weird that they just didn't understand. And then later when I had the follow up with the OB, that they were saying that actually it's t it's actually sort of a common condition that women can have because the baby will press on in early pregnancy the baby's lower i guess in your abdomen and then they it can press on your bladder so that it's actually kind of like an obstruction and so you you just literally can't go to the bathroom uh but then in the regular er it's just kind of weird that they you know, they're kind of a little dumbfounded on what yes. everything that was going on. But I will say that, you know, my hospital does have 
a pregnancy ER that's specific. That's it's really wow. nice. But the downside is that they don't let you go until you're like in your second trimester, which I was kind of upset about. And I think it's kind of a, so I, I mean, I understand it because like, you know, so many women have miscarriage and issues like that. So I get it. But at the same time, I, f- I believe that women should be entitled to during all of pregnancy and even postpartum, as you were saying that they should be entitled to a little bit more specialized care. Uh, and then, yeah. When- or at least somebody that knows what questions to ask and how to, how to answer basic things like, can I breastfeed on this? You know, is this safe for my baby? Is this going to change my milk production? Is this going to affect postpartum bleeding? Things like that, that they don't typically encounter in a normal patient. But I also kind of want to, you know, push back on like, like, what is that idea of normal? Why is somebody who is a mother considered out of the norm? Why are studies done on men and not people who menstruate, right? Like, I think we need to kind of reclaim that birth is normal as a part of life. And right. so it's half no excuse the, for not knowing about it. Right. Yeah. Half of humanity can get pregnant. <laughs> so yes. to not have something specialized for that, it's mind boggling. But yeah. if any of our listeners yeah. want to learn more about the med- medical aspects of that, we actually, um, and then postpartum women, pregnant women, that's something we could also get into for a very long discussion. But we did do an episode in episode 53 uh, entitled Feminism and Motherhood uh, with Leah Labresco, where she kind of gets into that if anyone's listening wants to l- learn more about nice. that. So as everyone knows, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm a lawyer, which is, I don't know if, I think most doctors probably don't like lawyers. I know some that do, but you know, the jury's out on that, uh, pun intended. So I just quickly Googled... Uh, postpartum hypertension, because I just wanted to educate myself a little bit more about your condition. And this journal article came up from the Canadian Medical Association Association Journal about postpartum hypertension. And I was trying to find a year Oh, in 2017. And it was super interesting that they actually say that 5.7 cases of preeclampsia or eclampsia may present for the first time, so de novo, in the postpartum period, up to six weeks, even without hypertension in pregnancy. And it says these women often present with new onset persistent headache or visual changes. And I thought it was interesting because their recommendation, how they start off this article is it says blood pressure should be measured three to six days after delivery and that blood pressure normally peaks in a postpartum woman three to six days after recovery after delivery. And that just goes in line with what you were saying that your symptoms started yeah. six days. So yeah. I mean, it's kind of a shame that women are just, just discharged from the hospital and not told to take blood pressure or to watch out for that. You know, um, yeah. I don't know. I just, it just struck me when I was reading this, that it was in your situation, if that's something that someone would have told you to be taking it every day, perhaps, you know, you maybe you could have been on top of it or something. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you said it exactly. My second child, I had had this experience before. And so I was looking for it. Right. I was aware that this was an issue that I had had. Um, and I'm also a chronic Googler. I'm not a doctor, but I am a scientist. I am a biologist and I do a fair amount of, um, scientific journal reading. So after this experience with my first, I dove into the literature too. And I wanted to find out kind of what do we know about this? And and like you said, sometimes this is a feature of preeclampsia or eclampsia in the absence of other symptoms. Sometimes it's just postpartum hypertension. So I was kind of aware of this issue. And uh, with my son, very similar path. I had pretty uneventful pregnancy, uh, fairly, you know, good feeling about how the birth was going to go. And then of course he was a week late, but James decided to be a little bit better behaved. And on the morning I was scheduled for induction, we went in and uh, he was already on his way and was born five hours later. So really nice, actually. Yeah, it was really great. I didn't have to kick him out, but um, good birth experience, a lot better actually than the first, like healthy baby, healthy mom, everything seemed just wonderful. Now I knew though that I was prone to, or could be prone to this issue of hypertension, high blood pressure following the birth. So I had talked with my doctor about this extensively. And um, I actually had switched doctors between my two kids because of some of the concerns I had with the first. Right. Um, I loved I loved my OB, but she was part of a big practice that rotated mm-hmm. deliveries. Right. 
And so she was not actually present at the delivery. Okay. And I had um, a hospitalist deliver my daughter. So due to that and some other um, concerns I had with her practice, I decided to leave and, and see this new doctor. Right. So one major difference between my two kids was not only was I proactive about this, but my doctor was also proactive. So he had me measuring blood pressure throughout. He was checking enzymes. If I had a somewhat high reading, he would do the full battery of lab tests looking for preeclampsia. So he was very on top of it, very um, attentive to my needs. So my son was born, blood pressures are checked, everything's looking good, but I had this sense of this could happen again. Right. So what I what I did was, um, you know, pretty much daily from the time we got home, I was, I was checking my pressures and every day they would tick up a little bit more mm-hmm. until on about three or four days postpartum, I got a recording that was like 165 over a hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, not in that you're going to die, you you know, but in that high and concerning, right. there was a trend this. going up. Exactly. The trend is going up and it's not changing if I, you know, try to lay down first or breathe deeply. You know, it's not just a matter of I'm nervous when I'm taking it. So another wonderful thing about this doctor is he gave me his cell phone number. So it was a a Friday evening. My doctor's really, I love this doctor. I can't say enough good things. Uh, He's a high school football coach also. So he was at his, um, at, at his game and I texted him during the game. I said, Good luck against Souths. Also, my blood pressure is really high. <laughs> um, and so he was actually able to call me oh, wow. call and talk about um, talk about the symptoms I was having and right. call in a prescription to the pharmacy. And I had it in my hands within two hours wow. on a Friday night. That's so, amazing. Yeah, really incredible doctor. Um, I, I could say a lot of good things about him. But so, so the big difference there, though, is, you know, I knew what to look for in myself. I had a doctor who, you know, believed that this was a potential issue and had at the ready. Now he wasn't worried about it. Mm -hmm. He was very calming, assured me, you know, you're not going to die. Like it's okay. Right. But was ready to step up and get me on the same medication as I was on before. Mm. And, um, kind of similar with, with my daughter, I was able to be on that for six to eight weeks and kind of wean off. Um, and am now totally off, um, that medication. That's so great. another thing that made a big difference the second time around is, like I said, I kind of dug into the literature and read some things, and I found a Facebook group of women who have also suffered from postpartum hypertension. It was great to be in the group because I think you touched on this at the beginning. It's it's really important to hear other women's stories. Right. It's important to see that you're not alone, and sometimes the medical literature can be pretty frustratingly sparse on certain conditions. Um, <laughs> that I found a study. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, and I just, you know, being a scientist, I know that not everything gets published and you wonder how many hundreds of stories are out there right. like your own mm-hmm. pre Facebook groups you wouldn't have known. So yeah. I found this great group and seeing in that group, how so many women were, you know, on medication long-term or mm-hmm. had had even worse pressures than me. And we're like living their lives and we're happy and good and had multiple kids. And, you know, I just, it helped me realize like, it's okay. Right. It also helped me get over the kind of like meta anxiousness about it. Cause I think sometimes when you have something wrong with you, especially that you can't quite figure out with your body, like Mm -hmm. sometimes it can feel sort of, um, like, a a failure of yourself. I don't know if you experienced. Oh yeah. Definitely. You know, you're like, what is wrong with me? Why am I not? healthy? Why do I have to be on this medication? Mm-hmm. And and just seeing that other people struggle too, and you can kind of lift each other up and say, it's okay. Like that was really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes me feel like both a failure and it's very lonely too, because obviously your friends and family, they can sympathize or empathize or try to as much yeah. as possible. But unless you've been in your shoes or someone who's been in your shoes, it's hard to completely relate. And so that's what's great about having a Facebook group. I'm also a part of a Facebook group for, you know, synthesis pubis dysfunction, uh, which is what I had after the birth of my daughter and also after James too, but similar situation as you since I had experienced it the first time. It wasn't as overwhelming the second time and and more depressing, to be honest, because the first time I just thought, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to walk again, those sorts of things because it's just so new. 
And, yeah. you know, my doctor at the time, you know, I had, I've also switched doctors the second time, um, didn't really know that much about it, those sorts of things. But then when, when you just have the knowledge walking into that situation with the knowledge, yes. it makes such a world of, dif- of difference, similar to your situation. So my second time, I just knew, okay, physical therapy can fix my problems. And just yeah. that knowledge alone, I wish someone would have told me that after my first, that you will get better with physical therapy or like it will help that even a simple sentence like that, that is so empowering and it, it makes you feel so much better. It's such a, such a sigh of relief that it's not going to be something permanent. So I'm sure that the first time that you would experience that, if someone had just told you, you know, okay, you can get these meds or this is what's going to happen. This is how long you might potentially be on it. Just the sorts of things that you see in, in the Facebook group that is just, a big mm-hmm. sigh of relief to to know that. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think my doctor the second time around sort of was aware of that kind of anxiety and stress in my in myself, wondering and worrying about what the consequences could be. Right. Like how much worse could it get? I'm very much a worrier and like always catastrophizing. But he was very careful to say, you know, you're not gonna die acutely of this thing. Mm. You're gonna get on this medication. We're going to monitor you. We'll see how it goes. You know, he was just very calming and, um, you know, was not quick to dismiss my symptoms and say, oh, it'll just pass. Acknowledged them and said, absolutely, we're going to get you treated. Right. But was also not catastrophizing and kind of helped assuage some of those fears. So I totally agree. Just having like even a name for what you're experiencing and a plan. Right. I can tell you're also kind of a type A person like me. <laughs> having a plan yeah. is so powerful. And it's even if even if there's uncertainty, I, I found that really freeing. Right. Um, and I think similar with those women in that group, like just seeing some of them, you know, go through worse than I did. Exactly. And come out the other side. Like some of them had real really serious cardiac issues associated. And I very thankfully was not. Um, didn't have anything except for just weird high blood pressure. Uh, and they were all fine and living their lives and having more children. And uh, that was that was really helpful for me to see. That's great. Yes, yeah, a similar thing with my Facebook group. You know, there's women in that group that who are on crutches and literally mm-hmm. cannot walk. And mine never got that extreme, even though I was in a lot of pain. So I was able to see that they came out of it. I mean, so, some didn't, which is really sad. And, and so they obviously get on there to, uh, you know, get some empathy. Uh, but most women do recover. So that is good to see it. So I'm curious, uh, with, with your second time, so you didn't have to go to the ER at all the second time because you were, were on top of it. Yeah, exactly. Like I, um, I did experience some of the same face flushing. I think that's just a, a symptom for me that, you know, I have pretty pale skin. And so like any, any sort of change really shows up. So I think that um, that is a symptom that I now know is a, a signal that I have some high blood pressure. Yeah. And since I was looking out for that, I had the blood pressure cuff from, cuff from the last time. I was able to take it at home and monitor mm. at home. Uh, and so I never had to go into the ER. I did go into my doctor's office to be fully checked out just to make sure that there was nothing else going on. Uh, but again, that was you know just in the clinic and not in the ER. Um, so it was really different experience the next time around. I think one thing is, you know, with the pandemic and everything moving virtual, a benefit is that we can do things like that, like, you know, text the doctor, um, do remote ordering from the pharmacy, you know, things like that, like that were just made possible by the help that I had as well as the kind of just new way of doing things. So that, that was really different the second time around. And, uh, I think that, you know, that contributed to my feeling a lot less worried about it It was just not having to be in that emergency setting without your baby, you know, and I mean, that was just horrible. So I'm glad not to have been through that again. That that seems stressful to me. I mean, especially with postpartum hormones, I'm just thinking that if yes, postpartum hormones and the unknown and having to go to the emergency room, I mean, that's, you just had a baby and then you're separated from your baby. It seems like pretty, pretty traumatic experience. So I know, I know that you have a science background since you mentioned, so it almost seems like listening to your story that it was a little bit easier for you after you had this experience to better prepare. Uh, and then also maybe, and you can also say, uh, you know, talk, speak to this yourself is 
in the ER, I wonder if you were a little bit a- uh, better able to advocate for yourself because you because you had that scientific background. So um, I'd love to hear if that helped you. And then also for women and mothers who don't have a scientific background, what would you recommend how they advocate yeah. or find answers to their to their questions? Yeah, that's a great question. And I struggle with this somewhat because I don't want to be that patient that's like, I've done my own research. <laughs> I, I know more than you, Dr. So-and-so, because nobody likes to know it all, right? Right. But I, uh, but I do have this biological background and I'm a, a person who likes to collect information. That's how I deal with stress is I get more information. So I have like spent me. a lot of, yeah, yep. I had spent a lot of time, you know, reading about this and hearing about this and things like that. So I'll start, I'll work backwards and say, yes, the second time around, because I had spent time reading and, you know, uh, trying to track down some of the causes of these things, I was able to, you know, sort of notice that um, my blood pressure seemed to be correlated with prolactin or the hormone that increases uh, and promotes milk production. Mm. So just the timing of things was really aligned with prolactin. My blood pressures would go up in the evenings and at nighttime, even though I should be, you know, at rest, but my blood pressure was highest, like in the middle of the night. And both of the times that it spiked after birth correlated with the day that my milk came in. So I noticed this relationship between prolactin and, or, you know, purportedly prolactin levels and this blood pressure issue that I had. And I was able to find, yeah, I was able to find some support for that in the literature. So that to me was helpful because, you know, it doesn't, the doctors are not necessarily concerned with why it's happening. They know that it's able to be treated and I was happy to get treatment. But for me, it was helpful to know that there was some sort of potential mechanism for what was happening. Again, I like to have information. So when it was just sort of this mysterious unknown, it's like, why am I sick like this? Why is my body doing this? That was much more stressful than having that potential mechanism. Mm. So that was really helpful after doing more research the second time around. The first time around, definitely, I felt as though, um, you know, it's it's hard to be sort of scientific and unbiased when it's you or your kids or somebody you care about. Right. Um, you know, it's easy to let the emotions cloud your judgment. But but I do remember in the, in the ER feeling like I, I, I did feel as though the doctor was um, somewhat dismissive and and that was frustrating. And I remember he... Um, he would wanted to administer some medication to treat the um, swelling of my face and things like that. Mm. And uh, I am not a doctor. I'm not a pharmacist, but I did know that that medication increased heart rate and blood pressure. And I said, I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable taking that given where my pressures are at right now. Wow. Um, And I think, you know, who knows if he would have changed his mind anyways, but we ended up not not going that route with that medication. Wow. And, you know, so something as simple as that is just knowing like what the potential side effects of some things are, right. I think is really, really helpful for people that are not aware. And maybe you, you know, are just not even comfortable, like saying the names of certain drugs, let alone knowing what they do. I think it's really important to ask your, your care providers, what is going into their decision-making? I would always feel comfortable asking that with this the second doctor that I had, if he was recommending one thing or the other. I'd say, how are you coming to that conclusion? Like what's weighing into your decision? Mm. And then it gives them the opportunity to explain it to you. And they might, you know, what you realize about medicine is medicine is not a science, right? It's a lot of judgment calls. Mm -hmm. It's a constant taking in information and, and using your best judgment. And, And that's great. That's how doctors have to operate. But if they can let you into that decision making a little bit, I think it's very beneficial. Right. If they can say, I'm weighing this evidence and this evidence and this I can, you know, consider this risk and this benefit, then you understand why they're making the decisions that they are and you can contribute in that way. Right. So I'd say that's the biggest thing is just engage in that conversation with your doctor, you know, and, and I would always ask like, what, what do you, where do you get this information and things like that? Right. Cause then you're not coming in and saying, I have more knowledge than you, or I've, you know, been to med school and you have, you know, you're not. <laughs> Not claiming knowledge that you don't have, you're staying in your lane, right? But you're asking them to show, kind of show their show their work to their answer and how they got there. Exactly, yeah. That's why it's called the the practice of medicine, right? Not 
<laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that that makes a lot of sense. And then just also in in my experience too that a good doctor from my interactions with different doctors that I've had, a good doctor if you are asking that question that you said, you know, how did you arrive at this decision? A good doctor would explain that and not feel threatened or think that you're questioning them or those sorts of things. A good doctor would be okay with that. And then if they're not, then yes. find another doctor who is. That's, you know, that's one thing that I I really liked about my doctor that I had the second time around. Well, he he was the on-call doctor for my daughter. And then mm-hmm. my husband and I really liked him. So then I switched to him the second time uh, when I had James. And I, I did ask him a lot of questions like that. You know, I when he would say different things and recommendations, uh, one thing that I was really worried about the second time around was the size of James because he was a huge baby. He was born at nine and a half pounds. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's huge. So, and so at every single appointment, he was measuring so big and so during the appointment, you know, he would say, do you have any questions or whatnot? And I always say, I'm just worried about his size. Is he too big? I don't want to go overdue. And and because I just kept on bringing that up, then we were monitoring his size. And we he was always checking that. And then when James looked like he was going overdue, since it sounds like I have my body similar to yours and that it likes staying it likes keeping the kids in a little bit longer. <laughs> so because <laughs> it looked like I was going overdue, then he said, yeah, let, he's measuring pretty big. Let's schedule that induction, which I'm so grateful for because he was born two days after his due date and he was nine and a half pounds. And if I would have gone 10 days over like my daughter, oh my gosh, <laughs> that would have been too big, too big. So anyway, I just yeah. that up because that, you know, that, that was a concern that I had. So when he would ask me or give certain recommendations, I would always bring up, what about his size? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And he was okay. Yeah, I, I think having, yeah, I think having a doctor, like you said, that isn't going to be offended if you ask questions, you know, is, is a huge uh, positive. I think also like, you know, having that balance between being an informed patient, reading the information that you can find and also, you know, trusting Trusting medical knowledge is, is is a personal decision that people have to make for themselves. Mm-hmm. By and large, though, I think, you know, if you don't trust what your doctor is saying, like, do do seek a second opinion, you know, find another medical professional that you trust. And, you know, it doesn't have to be one and done, especially if you have time to make a decision. Um, you know, you can you can seek multiple perspectives. I don't mean go on Facebook and just ask randos. I mean, the support <laughs> yeah. is helpful, but of course they're not, you know, it's not medical advice, but, right. um, but just, you know, feeling free to make, make your decisions as fully informed as possible. I think so often we feel like we just have to go with whatever is first recommended to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for, for my experience with my first, I, I had a long time where I was, you know, feeling like, well, I, I kind of got dismissed a couple of times by certain practitioners, both in the hospital and then the clinic afterwards. And I didn't have the confidence to say, you know, I want a second opinion. Mm-hmm. Like I want to, I want to talk to somebody else about this. I kind of wish I had, cause I might've, you know, experienced a little bit better recovery. And mm-hmm. I dealt with some uh, postpartum anxiety and things like that, both first and second time around that I just felt so much more empowered the second time around to say, no, I know myself. This is not normal. Mm. This is not how I want to be. You know, you can just kind of, I keep coming back to advocate for yourself, but really it is, you know, learning when to ask for that second opinion um, and be confident without being the know-it-all who pulls out the Google scholar and is like, I got my MD from Google, you know, I try not to be that person, but I do, I do like to, um, as be as informed as possible. What gave you the confidence to eventually speak to yourself? I, I know obviously you have the scientific background, but I know that from my experience, personal experience, and just from reading in general, that women in general aren't yeah. as assertive as men. I think that's a pretty known fact in general, obviously, you know, probably female lawyers tend to be more assertive than the average female, right? But I just would love women and mothers listening to be empowered to be an advocate for yourself. And since I know that women's default is to not be that way, you know, we're the nurturers, the carers, we're 
generally, again, I'm just being general here. I know that people probably listening say, oh, well, so-and-so isn't like that, or I'm not like that, that I'm just speaking in general that women are tend to be uh, more nurturing, not as aggressive, not as assertive. You know, that's why women aren't usually the ones starting wars, those sorts of things. So <laughs> what, um, what gave you the confidence to be your own advocate? Yeah, well, I think women are often not very assertive, not just because of our personalities, but because we're so often dismissed, right? As mm. things are brought up and, and they're not believed and um, some of the very old tropes of women being too emotional to know what's really going on, right. unfortunately, are alive and well in some fields, including medicine. And we uh, history, I think this. I, oh, I was just going to say, we have that history too of committing crazy women. Yes, to, uh, insane asylums, literally. Yes, so. exactly right. So we have this very complex medical uh, historical background of things not being taken seriously. So not just in your head. <laughs> um, I think. You know, the scientific background does help a lot because it kind of allows me to adopt some of the language of the doctors mm -hmm. that they're using and understand when they explain things in certain terms, understand that there might be uncertainty around, you know, that particular medication side effects or something like that. Um, I think the biggest thing, though, was, you know, finding confidence in in my kind of inner experience and not doubting my inner experience. Um, that sounds very contrived, but I think sometimes you experience a symptom or you feel something and you're like, huh, I wonder that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel normal. This could be mental or physical. And you kind of start to doubt whether you're feeling it or not. And maybe there's a healthcare practitioner who says, well, maybe you're just feeling gas bubbles, or maybe you're just feeling a little tired, or maybe it's just, you know, and they sort of insinuate it's in your head. Like you're not really feeling this. So for me, I think finding that confidence was a big, a big part of that was just trusting what I was experiencing in my body and really trying to listen to that mm. and, you know, taking stock of that somewhat regularly without being too obsessive about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and having that uh, verified and validated by, a, again, that doctor I trusted who was very careful to say, you know, what you're experiencing is real. It's not life-threatening. It's not these things that you're maybe worried that it is. Cause I, of course, again, go addicted to Google scholar, like went and found all these horrible conditions that I could have. Right. And I, I had brought some of them up to him and said, well, what about this? Did you check for this? Mm -hmm. He was quick to assure me, no, you don't have, you know, cardiomyopathy or something like that, but what you're experiencing is real. Mm. So I think just trusting what you're feeling. I mean, it, again, it sounds so trite, but trust the symptoms that you're having take stock of them, make observations, you know, keep track of things. I think all of that can work in your favor mm. and no one can deny your experience. Like they might try to, and they might say, well, you're not really feeling that, but at the end of the day, you at least have, at least have that. So I think that was a big thing. Second time around was just knowing that what I'm experiencing is real and not just all in my head or hysteria or something like that. I love that a lot because and anyone, even someone without a scientific background could then relate to that and say, I do trust my experience and what I'm feeling. And that's something universal that, that every single woman listening yes. can do. So yes, uh, absolutely. I've really loved our conversation so much. I, I feel like we could just talk even more about of different scientific aspects and you know the research that you've done yeah. and everything but I, it was just so informative of your experience with postpartum hypertension and I hope that even just one woman listening if she might have symptoms that she th might think are postpartum hypertension or even preeclampsia or maybe she has a friend who has something weird going on postpartum or when she's pregnant then she'll be able to get the help that she wants and also be empowered to be her own advocate as well. So I'd love to ask you the question that we ask every mom that comes on our show. And I know that you've listened to our podcast, so you you know what this question is, but uh, it's a little bit more personal. And that's, can you give an example of a time when you realize it's okay to not be a perfect mom and it's okay to be a good one instead? I love that question. And I love that. That's kind of part of your mission here. Um, I think for me, just with the health stuff is a great example of, you know, not 
shaming myself for being sick. It's so bizarre. Like if somebody tells you, oh, I have cancer or I struggle with chronic illness, you don't judge them. You want to, you want to embrace them. Yeah. So just recognizing that and, you know, giving that grace to myself the same way I would to somebody else and saying, it's okay to not be super mom who literally has no health problems and is this like machine, right? It's like, it's okay to be good mom who has health problems, but treats them and, and takes care of herself and her body. Um, I would say that that's a mindset shift I'm still working on, but uh, I think it's something we can all take to heart is that you don't need to be ashamed of having illnesses of any kind, mental or physical, and that you can take care of them and still be a great mom. I love that. Yeah. As, as you know, with my story, I can relate to that so much uh, specifically yeah. with the medical problems and having to go to physical therapy and, and just the acceptance of just saying, this is who I am and not comparing yourself to other people and being okay with who you are and in your struggles yeah. and your individual situation that you're going through is, is amazing. So thank you so much, Meg. I really appreciate it. And for anyone listening to, if you enjoyed this podcast, we'd really appreciate it. If you would leave a review, that would mean so much to us. Uh, just scroll down to whatever app you're listening in and leave a little review. You can also hit however many stars you want to rate us and, Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. So thank you so much again, Meg. And I'm sure I'll see you online since we're part of very, uh, very, a lot of um, Facebook groups. I know that that we're part of the same ones. So I'll see you online. (laughs) Yeah, see you online. Thank you, Emily. Thank you.